Hello, I'm Craig Merriweather, and this is Tipping Point Radio, and you're listening to The Mastermind Show. Are you tired of the self-sabotage, the overeating, the drinking too much, the relationships that always seem to end up mired in the same issues and challenges? Well, then maybe you need to tame your outer child. Susan Anderson is a psychotherapist who has devoted over 30 years of clinical experience and research to working with the victims of abandonment trauma, grief, and loss. Susan is the author of Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Your Self-Defeating Patterns, and Journey from Abandonment to Healing. She's founder of the Abandonment Recovery Movement, a worldwide program of techniques and support groups that help people heal their abandonment wounds past and present, overcome their self-defeating outer child patterns, and find greater life and love. Through extensive clinical research, group work, and scientific study, Susan has developed a treatment protocol specific to overcoming the impact of abandonment trauma in adults and children. Through her books and public appearances, she shares her own experiences with abandonment, grief, and recovery, speaking passionately for personal and professional experience. Now here's my interview with Susan Anderson. Hello, Susan. Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Your work is centers around abandonment and dealing with self-defeating patterns, and I'm I'm interested in self-defeating patterns and, and somewhat confused by them because why would we specifically want to sabotage ourselves? We, you would think we would have, at least our subconscious mind would have our best interests in mind, uh, no pun intended, and yet uh, a lot of us get uh, messed up uh, by our own minds uh, uh, sabotaging us. Well, most of the self-defeating patterns that we have developed, they're, they're sort of elaborations on patterns that we developed earlier on. So they're kind of primitive and they're knee-jerk reactions. You know, um, unresolved abandonment that we have within us from going through all the things that we went through as children, the losses and disconnections and disappointments and sometimes real, you know, real abandonments that we had as children – those things create kind of a primal wound within, and the way we defend ourselves is sort of through these automatic, you know, defense mechanisms that eventually become maladaptive. So we find ourselves letting our sort of the mammal part of us rule the human intellectual part of us. We know what we should be doing, but the mammalian part just kind of wins out because it is trying to seek comfort And it's trying to reduce tension, and so it thinks, well, having a third glass of wine or a second helping of pasta or procrastinating um, or seeking some sort of other kind of escape, you know, avoidance or something, that that's, that's easier than actually dealing with something. And we wind up sabotaging ourselves that way. Well, abandonment can come in so many forms. I was doing a little prep work for the interview and I started thinking about abandonment and abandonment can take so many forms from mom dropping you off at preschool, uh, you know, moving towns, uh, going to different schools. So you, you leave your friends, breaking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend in high school, your parents separating and divorcing, or maybe they separate and divorce in a very ugly, traumatic kind of way. Uh, you get laid off from a job, you get fired from a job, your business fails. There's so many uh, ways abandonment can show up in your life. And I was kind of looking at this list and I'm checking these things off. I was like, well, sure, sure. This is me. This is me. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm kind of screwed because if I've had these abandonment stuff happen in my life and abandonment means unworthy, I've kind of programmed my subconscious mind for unworthiness. Well, it's true. Abandonment is a universal wound. It's, it's univer- the fear of abandonment is universal to all people. It's what holds us together. It's what gives us something that we have in common. It's what makes us human, really. And so are the defense mechanisms. We all have defense mechanisms. I don't think either one of us know anyone who wouldn't claim that they have some form of self-sabotage. Everyone avoid something instead of facing it head-on, or procrastinates, or wishes they hadn't said a particular thing, or wishes they had spoken up when they should have, and so forth. I don't know anyone, no matter how high-functioning, who doesn't claim to have some level of self-sabotage. That, too, is part of being human. We may beat ourselves up for it unmercifully, but we all have it to some extent. Um, The trigger that that sets it off varies from person to person, and there are many, many triggers that 
you know, that each of us can have, depending on what we've been through. But the fact that we can get in our own way is universal, and that is the form of self-abandonment. It's universal for all people to to exhibit some form of self-abandonment. In other words, not doing things that are in our own best interest all the time, leaving ourselves behind, you know, kind of being angry with ourselves and not loving ourselves enough to forego the need for instant gratification in order to achieve a goal. So we don't love ourselves enough to not eat the second piece of cake. We only love ourselves enough to give ourselves the instant gratification but not give ourselves the long-range benefits of a long-range goal. And this is, this is something we all share just to greater and lesser extents. Well, you know, how do you treat yourself better when the proof is that you are unworthy? You've, you've gone through 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of watching yourself be abandoned, and, and, and this has now become this pattern. How do you treat yourself better when the world seems to show you that you are an unworthy person? And that's, that is the million-dollar question, because the, the truth is that it seems like it should be so easy, right? Because our rational mind can say, you know, I really shouldn't lounge in front of the TV set all day Sunday. I should clean out the garage, you know. Um, I mean, some people love to clean out the garage, but they're doing that to avoid having an important conversation with their family or something, you know. Um, but the the key is what... What allows us to finally overcome this thing? And the answer is, it's not easy. There's a lot of effort involved, but there is a way. And the way involves reconnecting the the internal self, you know, reversing the self-abandonment and creating a dialogue between the adult mind, the rational mind, and this sort of mammal presence, this, this outer child that I call it, this nemesis that lives within, and having a dialogue that matches up the the adult to the emotional self, the inner child, so that the outer child can be tamed. And it isn't through osmosis or just simple awareness. We have lots of awareness, but it doesn't solve, you know, all of our problems. Awareness is only a step one. Um, so it's it tools that involve actually doing exercises that lead to this. But if we do the exercises, you know, regularly and we really take it seriously, we begin to chip away at our patterns and we overcome it. Well, the name of your book is Taming Your Outer Child. And I think a lot of us are familiar with the inner child or we've been told over the years to, to get in touch with our inner child. Uh, what's the difference? Well, the outer child represents the behavior where the inner child represents the emotions. So we could have a very powerful emotion of being, let's say, on a date with someone that we, we care about but we're very insecure with, and the inner child can feel unbelievably insecure and needy and very, you know, very unsure of where the relationship is going. Those are all feelings. But the outer child can act it out by being too demanding, by aiming suction cups, you know, these big emotional suction cups at the other person, or by clamming up and becoming wooden, or by becoming difficult and angry. The outer child is the part that acts out the feelings that the inner child is feeling. But when we use the tools of the program, we can administer to the inner child without expecting the other person to do it for us. In other words, let's put us back on that insecure date we can complete our own loop and reassure ourselves and make ourselves secure so we're not acting out the need for the other person to make us feel secure. And that leaves the other person out of that loop and we get to take care of ourselves and nurture ourselves so that we're, we're really acting in, independently, you know, and interdependently on the date and we're not acting out anymore. So the inner child is the emotion, and the outer child is the, is the inappropriate acting out of the emotion. Well, it seems that the outer, I assume that this would be an outer child thing, but if we are dealing with abandonment issues, self-sabotage, uh, self-defeating behaviors, that we uh, magnetize to us or we're attracted to people who are wrong for us. 
and, oh, yeah. and, and may, you know, replay these abandonment things over and over again. Uh, why do we end up pursuing people who aren't right for us? Yes, well, that's one of the biggest outer child behaviors out there, the attraction to the unavailable. Uh, outer child's most infamous characteristic is being attracted to all the wrong people. And a lot of it has to do with numbness. It's, it's kind of a convoluted explanation, but when people hear it, they know that it's true. When you go through an abandonment experience in a relationship, you spend a good deal of time as the relationship is ending or when it's, after it's already ended, you spend time yearning for someone who's not available. So this yearning for someone who's left you or doesn't love you or has rejected you becomes what you begin to associate with love. And so then you get ready to find a new relationship, but you find that you're numb. If somebody doesn't arouse those yearning, insecure feelings, you don't know you're in love. You can't feel the, the same, you know, sweet puppy dog chemistry that you used to feel toward a willing partner. Now you can only feel alive and you can only feel your feelings if somebody's arousing your insecurity and making you feel the challenge of maybe they'll – They'll like me, and maybe they won't, and they'll change their mind. You can only feel that sort of high-stakes drama of pursuing an, an unavailable person. And then, of course, when you catch the person, and now you're feeling secure with them, and they're madly in love with you and want to get together with you, and now you lose interest because you've lost the ability to feel sort of the normal you know, nice feelings that you used to be able to feel when you had a mutual relationship. And so having no idea that this is going on, people just keep pursuing unavailable partners so that they can feel something, even though the something they feel winds up being toward the wrong person and it causes pain. Well, let's go back uh, to our high school years maybe and even before. We've had a lot of these... Uh, Patterns develop due to what we perceived was abandonment. Uh, we either, you know, mom dropping us off at preschool or our constant uh, revolving door of girlfriends and boyfriends uh, were uh, love each other one week and the next week we break up or friends move right. or we move. You know, you said, and, and this is what I, I find really um, amazing and curious, but I heard you say once that having an emotional wound is not a bad thing. And I was wondering if you could explain that. Having an emotional wound is not a bad thing. It's actually to get in touch with it as a gift because it allows you to heal from the inside out because when you're not in touch with it, when you're sort of going along and nothing has really, you know, caused any deep emotional sensation, it's harder to get in touch with the core of our beings, and that's what we have to reach into to work on the self-sabotage. <laughs> But when something gets us, when we're in a relationship that makes us miserable and insecure, it, it, it sounds terribly painful, but it also is an opportunity that says, wait a minute, I'm looking to an outside person to, to satisfy a wound that is my own to take care of. I've been in a state of self-abandonment for years, and now I have a chance to reach in and find a way to heal my own wound and really lift my own wound and be very gentle and kind and caring and nurturing to myself because I have to learn to do this for myself so that I don't have my place my needs so to speak in somebody else's hands all the time so having being in touch with that abandonment wound not only connects you to other people and gives you a velcro surface you know a sticky surface that allows you to really appreciate connection with another person, but it allows you to get in touch with yourself and become more independent on a deeper level than ever before. Well, I think we've kind of gone through and touched on what the issues are. Uh, how do we get rid of it uh, or deal with this? In your book, Taming the Outer Child, you go through lots and lots of exercises. This kind of sounds like work. Unfortunately, it is work. Um, I'm not the one that, that gives the uh, magic pill answers, you know, and I know people are looking for it. In fact, I myself look for magic pill answers all the time because who wants to sit down and start, 
you know, working, chipping away at something. Everybody wants that. We all do. We're human. But unfortunately, these patterns are very deeply inset. You know, the the brain, they're etched into the brain, into the hardware of the brain. And we need physical therapy for the brain to get rid of them. So like when you have a sore shoulder and you go to the physical therapist and the physical therapist says, raise your arm five times, do that three times a week and come back, you think, oh boy, this is never going to help me. But sure enough, it helps. And so the exercises are exactly the same way. It's physical therapy for the brain. They're little, they're small, they're not hard to do. But yeah, they're, they're not instantaneous. You have to actually do the exercises. Well, I, I, um, going through your book, one of the things you talk about is imagination. And I wonder if you could explain how using your imagination can actually help with this. Well, you know, uh, we hear a lot about the higher power, and the imagination really is your higher power. Um, your, your imagination allows you to connect with the worlds outside of yourself, be it if you, if you happen to be someone who who can imagine a spiritual world, well, then you connect with that spiritual world. If you live in a very material world and um, a very empirical world, it allows you to connect with the amazing miracles of that empirical world. You, your imagination is the part of the brain that contains the ability to that get larger than, it, than you are now. It, it's the part of the brain that allows you to stretch. And what happens with the imagination is you can picture, you can imagine, you can pretend yourself sometime in the future with these problems that you have already behind you. You can imagine how wonderful you would feel. You can imagine, you can pretend it, that you feel wonderful as if it's already happened. You can imagine and pretend that you feel gratitude to yourself, to your higher power, to whatever powers that be, that you have your life problem solved. And by stretching your mind in that direction, you can increase your mind's ability to help you reach those solutions. So the imagination is a shortcut. It's a tool that is a shortcut so that instead of the physical therapy having to take three months, it'll take less because your imagination helps you to stretch. It's like heat. It is the heat that allows the exercise to, to work more quickly and more more substantial. Yeah, I, I was uh, listening to you and, uh, you know, imagination to me, I kind of equate with childhood, but you say the greatest strengthening tool for adults is the imagination. And I, I was just yeah. wondering if, how does it work? If, if I'm having abandonment issues, do I kind of imagine myself as surrounded by loving friends and, and that kind of thing? Yeah. As long as you don't fill in, you, you, you want to use your imagination sort of realistically so that if you're not in a relationship, let's say, um, and you want to imagine that you'll meet somebody at some point in the, in the near future, sooner rather than later, right, if you're alone, you're going to picture a person, but you're not going to fill in all the details because you're not, it's not magic. You're not going to materialize someone out of thin air. But you're going to imagine a person, you're not going to fill in the details, but sort of a general outline. But more importantly than the person, you're going to imagine yourself feeling the joy that you would feel as if you already had that person. Because you're an adult and you're not, you, you're not playing three magic fishes. You're really thinking realistically as an adult. You're bringing your ability to think realistically and your ability to imagine, all of which involve different regions in the brain, different networks, let's say. And you're using your ability to emote and to imagine feelings so that you're bringing that element of the brain in. You're combining, you're integrating the use of huge, vast networks of your mind and brain in coming up with with these ideas. And so... It, you were, when you were a child, using your imagination was much easier, but you didn't integrate it with as many other things. And now as an adult, you can really pull it together and really exercise the part of the brain that really helps you move forward. It helps you get unstuck. Well, now this is working okay. I, I imagine the feelings of have, being in a living relationship. How would I do that, say, if uh, I want to lose weight? 
Well, it works really well with weight loss. Um, there's a whole chapter in Taming Your Outer Child on weight loss because that's such a common problem so many people have, and it's so very outer child to overeat and not exercise, et cetera. But you can, the use of the imagination is such a helpful tool used in conjunction with the other exercises because you can imagine yourself already fit, already feeling good about yourself because you're looking better and feeling better and fitting into your clothes in a way that you that you have wanted to. You pretend that it's already happened and you get in touch with the feelings that you have as if you already have achieved that that you know that goal and you imagine how grateful you feel to yourself and to the powers that be that you have arrived at that place and you keep throwing that image up on the screen of your mind all the while knowing that you're using your imagination that this is your goal, you're integrating that with your realistic thinking, that this is not going to happen by magic, that you will have to take actions to accomplish this goal. And then you throw onto the screen of your mind how good you feel about yourself because you've done all of these things as if you've already done them. And then, But with the knowledge that now you must do those things, you must actually... Start to change your behavior. And what happens is the use of the imagination, thinking of it in the future, you know, as if it's already happened, helps to motivate you so that it's easier to take those actions going forward. If you can picture the end result, it's much easier to say no thanks to the third glass of wine or to the second bowl of cereal in the morning. Okay, well, well let's bring that up. Um... Let me give you a, a scenario. I've, it's after work. I've had a really bad day at work. I had gotten into a fight with my spouse the night before. Uh, it's just been a really crappy day. I'm, I'm walking down the street to my car, and I pass the cafe. And in the cafe, they have uh, a great selection of cheesecakes and pastries. And I'm thinking, you know, it, it's been a bad day, and uh, I know I'm trying to lose weight, but this would, um, this would be great. It's not really not going to hurt me. Uh, I'm really like a gain weight. Uh, it won't help me, but uh, I deserve this. How do I keep myself from doing that? Well, if, let's just say we'll add to the scenario that that very morning you were doing your exercise that had you hear your inner child say, I really can't stand having my stomach stick out like that. I really want you to help me look better. I feel so bad about myself. And if you had had a, a sort of a, a, an, an encounter, which is very, it sounds complicated, but it's very easy to do in, on paper, um, with your inner child where you really, really understand and, and have compassion for your own needs, you'll walk right past the cafe because it simply isn't an option. But let's say you haven't done that exercise in a couple of days or in a week or a month and you walk past, then it requires, in order to really not let your outer child take control, it requires having really the, the, the ability to use insight on the spot. I find it's very hard for people to do that. And so very often, outer, especially at the end of a work day when you're tired and you've had a bad day and you've had an argument and so forth, and you're feeling miserable, outer child is especially strong and will want it to get its way, will swoop in to take control. So let's say that that happens and you wind up going in there and buying the, you know, the pastry and blowing your diet. Well, the exercises in the program are there to help you understand what happens when you make a mistake, how to compensate for it, and how to get back on track. Well, because understanding what it was that made you, at, at that moment, give in to your outer child is a tremendous tool to have. But you'll learn that you can't just expect, you know, outer child to go away happily. Outer child's always going to be tapping you on the shoulder. So you do have to keep, you have to stay on your toes. Sure, it, it becomes a big, uh, maybe game's not the right word, but a big game of awareness. Yes. It's, yeah. a, it's an awareness game. It is an awareness game. Well, I want to uh, talk about your website uh, real quick. It's outerchild.net, 
And first off, uh, it's one of the cooler websites I've ever seen with the, the puzzle pieces. That's really uh, fun. But there's actually an outer child checklist. I wonder if you could explain what that is and what people are supposed to do with that. Yeah, I, the Outer Child Checklist is fun. It's designed to be fun. And guess who every single one of those characteristics is uh, was, is based on? That would yeah. be me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's like 250 items on it, and they're all me. Um, and some of them are mortifyingly embarrassing. But the beautiful thing is that when you start to identify your outer child through the checklist or just through coming up with your own ideas for it, you start to discover that it's perfectly natural and normal to have all of these traits, that we all have them, that we don't have to be ashamed of them, and that they come from the need to defend ourselves. So it's fun. It's more or less a fun tool to go through and check off, yep, I got that one, yep, talk about friends behind their back, yep, do I, you know, going off checking, gleefully checking off things that just yesterday you were trying to deny, because there they all are written out in black and white. It's kind of fun, it's freeing, but it also improves awareness. It kind of keeps you on your toes. Well, the other thing... You submit them to oh. me. I, I keep copious records of all oh. these things. And, People and, submit them to me. Oh, that's really interesting. Do you actually look through them and see what... Do you, well, do you... uh, yes, when I wrote the, the Outer Child book was written 10 years after I had written the Abandonment book, which had Outer Child in it, which is where you know Outer Child was introduced for the first time. And over the 10 years, I don't know, probably a thousand or so or more people wrote to me about their own outer child characteristics. And so I incorporated those characteristics into the outer child book and onto the website. So they're, they're me, but they're also contributed by many people writing in. But do you see any sort of patterns in these patterns people are talking about, like, in the springtime, you see more love issues, whereas maybe the, the fall, you see more eating issues or that kind of thing? Uh, eating issues seem to be most prevalent around the holidays, um, and people are looking to gain control by the summer. That's no surprise. Romantic issues span the entire year, but they're especially painful around the holidays because other people are in couples and getting together with fam families and having little Valentine's dates, and there you are you know, with no one to um, celebrate with. Some people are lacking families to be with on the holidays. It's a very difficult time. And also, on, for summer vacation, millions of people can't go on summer vacation because they have no one to go on vacation with. Their friends are all coupled or, you know, there are so many people who are sort of, stuck with needing to be on a vacation and being alone at the same time, and it's not easy. So I get a lot of uh, responses at that time. Well, I wanted to, another thing that is on your website is abandon holism, and I guess what that's a, a being addicted to to love or being addicted to to the feelings of being abandoned. Yes, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's being addicted to love because you're addicted to feeling abandoned and you've come to associate the feeling of abandonment with love. Your, your, your wires in your brain have become crossed. And so now when, you're feel, when somebody makes you feel insecure and if somebody makes you feel like they would abandon you, ups, you're in love. That means you're in love, you know. So you become abandoholic because you, you really are caught up, you get easily hooked in a relationship if there's an emotional challenge. Well, the, you're Abandoholism is very common. It is extremely prevalent. Well, it would just seem, uh, I don't know, it, it, would, it, would, it would just be, it seems like that's such a devastating thing to, to have. Well, there are a lot of people who cope with these issues out there in the world, and because there are other things in life that keep their lives balanced. They're able to still live and look look like they're having a good time and and work professionally and and so forth. But this is so much more prevalent than it than is admitted to. Um, there, so many people have so much time dealing with a mutual love. If they're in a long term relationship and they feel secure with the person, they feel. A lack of interest, they feel bored, they, they say, I, I love my husband or wife, but I'm not in love with them. That is the most common thing I hear because they have lost the ability over time 
to love someone who loves them back, the mutual love feeling is so difficult for so, so many people. It is so prevalent. And it's not really written much about, except in my work that I've, that I've read. I mean, some people do write about the chemistry of love, the neuro- neurochemistry of it, and they do a wonderful job of that. So there's some discussion about it, but not as much as there should be, considering how prevalent it is. Well, I want to talk about your other website, abandonment.net, and there's a lot of lot of stuff to go through on on this website. Um, I was wondering, if there seems there's like a membership site, and I wonder if you could just kind of explain what people can find on that website. Well, the abandonment.net is the two the websites work in tandem because, of course, the flip side of abandonment is is self sabotage. If you have abandonment issues, you will have self sabotage. Or you could say, if you have self-sabotage, if you have outer child problems, then you have unresolved abandonment. I mean, so you need to sort of work on both at the same time. Um, And so I've created the two different websites so that it's two windows for people to enter into this recovery from. Um, And there's a member center that you can join that gives you a workbook, and it gives you some contact with with me or with, with, um, you know, uh, uh, my assistant who will you know, kind of respond to your email in a, in a uh, empathic um, kind of an assessment way, and it gives you connection to other resources, uh, how to set up an abandonment group, et cetera. It gives you sort of an in with, with the abandonment staff. And um, it's uh, on the abandonment website, but you can get to it from the Outer Child website. Uh, one more question. There, there's the book Black Swan. I wonder if you could Tell people about that book. Well, the book, uh, that book I wrote right with the blood dripping out of my own abandonment wound when I went through abandonment, my own powerful adult abandonment after 18 years of a blissful marriage that ended abruptly. Um, and it, it talks about the 12 steps that one has to take to commence the healing process. And it It is the actual broken down into steps way that you start to pull yourself back together again. And it's written in allegory form in great big huge print to keep it really simple, almost childlike, because it needs to be easy to read and very vivid in a storytelling way in order to really get in, to get the message in. Well, the books are Black Swan, The Twelve Lessons of Abandonment Recovery. There's Taming Your Outer Child, a revolutionary program for overcoming self-defeating patterns. And there's also The Journey from Abandonment to Healing. Uh, Susan, I I so appreciate you being on the show and and all the work you're doing. Because, you know, most of us, if not all of us, have some sort of abandonment stuff that we need to deal with. And so I appreciate all the work you do. Well, I appreciate you having me on the show. Well, the websites are abandonment.net and outerchild.net, and you can find her on Facebook and Twitter from those websites. And thank you again, Susan, and I definitely want to have you back on sometime. Well, thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. 